Hello dear viewers and welcome back to the series 11 Reviews One Year On. It's the 4th of November which means it's time for... The Saranga Conundrum. Looking back on last year, the Saranga Conundrum was my least favourite episode. I mentioned that last Friday, I think my exact words were the worst episode of last series. So there you have it, thanks me. Look, to be honest with you, I put off watching this episode this week. And I found myself enjoying it... in the end. <laughs> Look, I think the opening is a bit strange. So we open on that junk planet with the Doctor and her friends searching for these parts she needs. I don't mind that opening. But something that Doctor Who does from time to time is it has the Doctor and her friends refer to other adventures they've had which sound more interesting than the ones we're getting. It goes right back to Christopher Eccleston in Boomtown with Rose talking about um, Justicia and the Glass Pyramid of San Clun. It kind of makes me wish, oh, I want to go rain bathing on Castano now rather than be in this junkyard. And I get that it is a bit of world building and character building, but it just reminds us that we're not in this really impressive sounding vista. Now, something I read last year was that the Pating, the monster in this story, was created by a writer called Tim Price. And something else I read, and I don't know if this part is true or not, is that he was originally meant to write the script for this story, but had to pull out at the last minute, or had another engagement or something, which led to Chris Chibnall writing the script. And I think that's possibly why this is Chibnall's weakest script of the series so far. And he kind of falls back on very established, tried-and-true storytelling methods. So we have a series of double acts on the ship, a writing method, favoured by Robert Holmes in the classic series, even if he didn't realise he was doing it. So once we get to the ship, we've got the medics Astos and Mably. We have Eve Cicero and her brother Dirkus. We also have Ronan in there, her consort, or um, clone drone. And it's never quite explicitly stated just how professional platonic or romantic the relationship between Ronan and Eve is. But of course, in our own modern world, we're starting to see robots being developed for adult purposes, shall we say. So I think Ronan is an extrapolation of that idea. We also have uh, the character of Yoss, who is a pregnant man, and the regulars get a chance to kind of swap in and out of being double acts with some of these characters as well. Now I think if this script was written as a last minute replacement and in a hurry, developing these kind of character relationships to move the plot forward is a really good idea and it gives us not only some character development for the regulars, but also some character development for these temporary characters who we have to get to know and hopefully like in the space of a 50 minute episode. Now, the one guest cast member I don't think is very successful in his role is Ben Bailey Smith as Dirkus. I also think the costume design for his character doesn't help, because all the other characters aboard the Sarangan medical craft, they have a sort of futuristic sci-fi aesthetic, whereas Dirkus looks like he was dressed in Top Man. Not that there's anything wrong with clothes from Top Man, but he looks very 21st century, whereas everyone else does look like they're in the future. Their story's set in the 67th century. I think possibly that shorthand for his career as an engineer, and through dialogue we're told that engineers are kind of looked down on in the society of pilots that the general inhabits, but... I think you could have done that while keeping him in the same aesthetic as everyone else. But in terms of his performance, a bit like Tanya Fear last week, I just find it a bit one note. There are certainly some touching moments with Eve and Dirkus, but I just feel like Suzanne Packard acts Ben Bailey Smith off the screen. But I don't want to harp on too much about things I don't like, because this episode has gone up in my estimation, and I have to ask myself, why has this improved 
for me. I picked up on subtler elements in this that I didn't pick up on last year. So for instance, starting off we have the characters of Astos and Mably, the medics who I mentioned before. They're a doctor and companion dynamic. They're the sort of David Tennant or Matt Smith, so he is a very attractive, charismatic, likeable man. That whole bit where he's talking to the Doctor about lying and trying to lie but trying to convince her that he's not lying. Also, he has this immense calm about him, which means when he says to the Doctor, you are putting my crew in danger, he doesn't need to raise his voice, he just changes his tone, and he has that Doctorish quality of controlling the situation, not through force, but through reason. And that builds up a respect and a rapport between him and the Doctor very, very quickly. Now, of course, we can only have one Doctor in the story, so he's got to die. And his final act is very Doctorish as well. His last words are to comfort and support his companion. Mably, as a companion role, is doubting herself and wondering whether she can do this job because she's so new to this. He's a veteran of 37 tours, she's only done two, and he tells her with his last breath that he believes in her. And it gave me a lump in my throat watching this, because I had realised that these two are a Doctor and Companion analogue in the more traditional sense, in the kind of Professor Yana and Chantho sense from Utopia. And what's really great is that Mably proves him right. She immediately steps up, she helps the Doctor, she delivers the baby, you know, she's part of the planning to deal with the Pating. And so these characters are really well sketched in a very short space of time. As I mentioned before, I really like the character of Eve. To me, she is a believable general and also has that pathos of she's got Pilot's heart, but she can't tell anyone she has Pilot's heart because that will discredit the organisation she believes in really strongly. And finally, the last character to explore is Yoss, and he is super likeable, quite charming. He's a young man who accidentally got pregnant on holiday and initially doesn't want to keep his baby, you know, because he feels he's not ready to raise a child. He feels that these are dark and turbulent times. A few characters refer to these as being dark times. And so his through line is whether he will keep the baby or not. And as we discover at the end of the episode, he decides to give being a father a go. And initially last year, I thought this episode wasn't about anything. And not every Doctor Who story needs to have a central message. But here's the thing, I feel you either need to have a message to the story or it needs to be a spectacle or an action piece. Some stories do both. But it's a problem when a story does neither, and I thought last year this story does neither of these things. But I realised it does have a theme, and that theme is instinct. So the Pating is guided to the ship by instinct. It doesn't care that there are people aboard needing medical attention, it just wants the power systems of the ship, it wants to feed. And it doesn't care if it hurts people or even kills people along the way. Eve is also a character being driven by instinct. She's being driven by her pilot instincts and her instinct for duty. And towards the end of the story, when she does pilot the ship, again, she is going on her original instincts. And those instincts, well, they do get her killed. But that's another part of her duty. Her duty is to protect others, and she dies doing that. Yoss is caught between two instincts. He's caught between the instinct of a young and carefree life, the life he's known, and the instinct to procreate, to create children, to bring new life into the world. And, you know, we kind of see that turning point in him when he's showing Ryan and Yaz his ultrasounds over the last two weeks. I was discussing this idea of instinct being the theme with a friend of mine, and he says, well, everyone has instincts. And I was wondering, could it be a fluke? You know, is it just a writing thing of Chris Chibnall saying, well, what does each character want? And then I remembered, it is actually referred to in the story. The Doctor talks about what does the Pating want. The Doctor talks about being guided by instinct. And the Doctor makes it clear that her primary instinct is hope. And that is what she spreads to everyone else, 
in order to get the Pating off the ship, in order to get the ship safely into port, in order even for Yoss to deliver his baby. Really, when Ryan is talking about how Yoss can do this and how he's creating a life and that in itself is spectacular, Ryan is running on instinct because he and Graham have no idea what they're doing, no matter how many episodes of Call the Midwife Graham has seen. The other thing that surprised me about this episode is that I've yet to see Yaz being massively underused. In this story, you know, she gets to defend the ship from the Pating. I did think that scene was a little weird because we're told at the beginning of that bit defending the antimatter engine that Ronan can actually handle the Pating, but Yaz is the one who punts it down the corridor. And when the Doctor enacts her final plan to get rid of the Pating, it's Yaz who's by her side and gets a really good bit of banter with the Doctor, and there's some great comedy tension in that scene. Yaz is still getting a fair share of the action, and I'm starting to wonder, is it the back end of the season that she's not? Because I seem to recall in Kablam! and The Witchfinders, she gets a fair bit to do in those as well. So, maybe there's some other reason I feel like Yaz is underused. I have a theory as to why I think I and others might feel that, but I'm going to come back to that at the end of the season to see if it holds up. In terms of design, I've already mentioned Durkus's costume, which I don't think really fits in with the aesthetic of everything else, but everything else, the ship design, the user interface for the machines, I really, really like it. I like the clean lines. I like that it feels like we've taken the idea of what a hospital is now and moved it into the 67th century. I'm also getting a little bit of London underground corridors from there, which sells the idea at the beginning that the Doctor thinks they're in a building. Even with that twist, I don't know what it was, but I kind of assumed they were on a spaceship. Um, when I was watching it the first time, it's like, her Doctor, you're on a spaceship. Something that I think, though, is uneven in this story is the direction. There are some very good moments of direction, but there are three, really, that stand out for me as kind of putting the brake on. One is the reveal of the Pating. So the Pating is a comedy monster. It's a Grask, it's a space pig. But the problem is, I don't think they knew what the design would look like while they were shooting the live-action actors, because the actors do a perfectly good job of reacting to a monster, but I feel like they're not reacting to the monster we're reacting to. I feel like we laugh at the Pating a bit, whereas none of the actors kind of look at it like it is the comedy, funny design that it is. That's a peril of working with CG. Things don't always come out looking how you expect them. There's also the scene where Ryan discusses his mother's death. Now, once again, Tosin Cole gives an excellent performance in this. I actually cried watching that scene this time around. But the direction, though, is what I have a problem with. Because Ryan and Yaz have been sent to get everyone together in the drawing room, <laughs> as the Doctor Guide puts it. But they then stop to have this conversation. And there's no motivation for them stopping. Now, Ryan does start moving again when the conversation becomes uncomfortable for him. But I feel like this is a disaster situation. It ties in with the other moment of direction that I don't think works, which is the Doctor's speech about the antimatter drive, which I think is a brilliant speech, and Jodie performs it really well. And it's giving us an educational science moment that still fits the character. But I just feel like the Doctor would be moving around and working while she's having this discussion, like she does in The Woman Who Fell to Earth when she's about to make her sonic screwdriver. She's talking to Graham and Grace and collecting things as she goes. And I think that would have improved this scene. That being said, there are other really great moments, such as Astos's death, the birth sequence is really well directed, the action sequence with Yaz and Ronan in the engine room. There are so many good bits of direction. There's just these three bits that kind of take you out of it, and in two cases, bring the urgency to a halt. And I think 
that's the big problem with the direction and where it's uneven, is that some scenes are performed very, very, very urgently and we must do this, and some scenes are like, oh, you know, okay, yeah, we've got a few minutes to live, but let's have a chat. Jennifer Perry, the director, will, from my memory, do much better work in Kablam coming up, so I really look forward to that. And, look, this episode was a first outing, so hopefully things will improve from here. In the end, I give this episode 7 out of 10. Uh, last year, I gave it a 5, so it's gone up quite a bit in my estimation. It's not a classic, I don't think it's going to top anyone's Series 11 poll or Jodie Whittaker poll, but actually, if this is your favourite story of the season, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. You know, try and convince me to make it a 10 out of 10, because there's lots of fun things in here, and there's good performances, and there's good design work. It just feels rushed. So my rankings as they stand, Rosa is still at number one with The Woman Who Fell to Earth coming in second, Arachnids in the UK is third, The Ghost Monument is fourth, and uh, The Saranga Conundrum is fifth. If I get to the end of this series and The Saranga Conundrum is still my least favourite episode, that makes for a pretty strong series of Doctor Who. I'll be back next week reviewing Demons of the Punjab, so do come back for that. And until then, thank you very much for watching.